Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to If Data Could Talk. I'm your host, Andy Cotgreave, Technical Evangelist at Tableau. And today, this is an episode I've been wanting to do for eight years. Uh, we are going to talk about the science of magic and how magic is the yin to the yang of data visualization. And yes, the cognitive processes that we use to confuse in magic are the same as the ones we use to communicate with in data visualization. We're going to meet our guest in a moment. But first, I figured you probably all wanted to see some sort of magic effect. Uh, so let's watch a bit of magic, shall we first? Here we go. Hi, everybody. This is Andy. I've got a simple maths puzzle for you today. Um, can you count from one, two, three, to four, five, six? Easy. You're all data nerds, so this shouldn't be too taxing. Okay, so we've got three on this side, three on this side. Three plus three is six. If you take one off the front, what's the total? Three plus three? Well, actually, it's only four because it's now two plus two. Two plus two. Let's go back. Start again, right? Now we've got three on this side and three on this side, just in case you weren't keeping up. If we take one off the front, we've got two plus, that's right, two on this side, two on this side. Now if we take one, go down to one on the front, what's the total now? One plus one. See, it's one plus one. If you're not keeping up, we'll just go back one. Two plus two is four, but if we take one off, it becomes one plus one. Now what's interesting is, See how the X is near the uh, thumb? It's on the handle end. Well, you can also make them jump. See how it jumped from one end of the paddle to the other? We can uh, we can make it come back as well to either end of the paddle. Pretty cool, right? Just like that. And what's also amazing is you can take the X off. So now you've got a completely empty paddle and then just throw it back on and it reappears. But it doesn't just reappear on that side, of course. It reappears on both sides. And the final thing you can do is Take the X off completely and the pen reappears and you're back to where you were when you started. All right. Thank you very much. All right. A little bit of fun for you. Hope you like that. Uh, so let's meet our guest who's going to help us understand why that is actually very, very appropriate for you as a data analyst. So Gustav, Dr. Gustav Kuhn, welcome to the show. Would you like to say a little uh, hello and intro? Hello. Uh, thank you very much for having me on the show. It's great to be here. Uh, so yeah, my name is Gustav Korn. I, uh, like Andy, I'm also a fellow magician. So I started my career very much as a magician, fooling and tricking people. Uh, but I'm now, I lead the magic lab at Goldsmiths, where rather than just using magic as a form of entertainment, we scientifically study magic to learn more about how the human brain works. So we study things like misdirection to understand how easy it is to get people to pre or prevent people from seeing things that are in front of their eyes. We study forcing techniques, which look at decision-making processes, and we apply a lot of this knowledge to the real world as well. So we're working with IT people um, to implement some of these principles in computer games, for example, and even seeing where we can teach robots and computer agents to use misdirection to deceive humans. So our research really spans the whole breadth of magic and science, and that's kind of like the things that we do in the Magic Lab. Fantastic. Well, it's so good to have you here. Uh, we're going to be talking first about the principles, and then and we're going to dive a bit more into the science of magic that you've helped uh, push forward in the last few years. For those that are interested in reading, uh, Gustav's book, uh, the, the Science of Experiencing the Impossible, is incredibly good. It's all about what we're going to talk about today. Um, my own journey here uh, started, I, I read another book, a, a similar book, Slight to Mind, about nine years ago, and it just opened my mind. So I, too, as a result of reading this, got into magic and have just loved developing, just loved understanding the science behind this database over the last nine years so good stuff let's get going um i think one of the principles we both magicians and data analysts have to come to terms with very quickly is the eye how do we see because the standard perception would be it's a camera right is that yeah. right or not yeah when we when we think about vision we often think about vision as functioning like the eye and Part of that is true. I mean, our eyes do take pictures of the world, but seeing doesn't happen with the eyes. Seeing all happens with the brain. Um, the eyes provide us with lots of data about the world, but it's all about how the brain interprets this data. And uh, I mean, you brought up here the 
duck rabbit illusion, which is a beautiful illustration of the importance of this inference process. So as you're looking at this picture, some of you will see a rabbit, others will see a duck. So I'll just give you a bit of time to just look at this. Um, what's interesting is the image can change as well. So you may be able to see a duck at this point of time and then it will suddenly switch over into a rabbit. Um, for those of you who didn't see it, Andy, you, do you want to point out the ears on there? Just um, Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we have, uh, is this a beak or is it an ear? Let's say the rabbit. These are the ears of the rabbit. Here is his eye and here is his uh, nose or snout. Uh, if you want to see a duck, here is his eye, but here is the duck's beak. And so uh, this is a part, this, this is known as a bistable image. And what it illustrates is that the data doesn't change. I mean, the data that you've got exactly the same image, but the way that you perceive the world depends on the way that your brain interprets this information. So if you look at it and you see it, you interpret it as a duck, <coughs> you will see it as a duck. <coughs> Sorry, and uh, if you interpret it as a rabbit, you will perceive it as a rabbit. And so even though our eyes takes pictures, our brain doesn't process pictures. So as I'm looking out of my window now, I just saw a car pass. Now, my brain doesn't store images of a car passing. What it does is it's got different neural centers that encode different properties. So there'll be information about its movement, its shape, its color, also its positioning as well. So I see something that is moving on the road. I then interpret that as is probably a car, and that's why I see it as a car. So although the eyes capture information the way that the camera does, seeing really happens inside the brain, and it's all about this inference. That's absolutely great. And, and again, so fundamental to, you, you know, you're saying things I was, I was learning about years ago uh, when I was getting into the field of data of it. Uh, I don't know, Gustav, if you've seen this one, but this is a, the data geeks version of the rabbit duck illusion. Uh, you can create a parabolic plot to define a rabbit or a duck, depending on which way you want to look at it. Uh, so this is my data nerd version. Um, so before I get into the, uh, well, actually, I, I, we're going to show you another effect now. Uh, this is genuinely the trick that triggered me into thinking I'm going to get into this. But it also demonstrates some of the things Gustav has just explained, but also helps us think about data bits. So here's another one for you to enjoy. The guy came up to me in the street the other day and he said, look, I've got a little game that I'd like to play with three playing cards. We've got this card, this card, and that card. He said, all you've got to do is keep your eye on that card. And as he said it, he moved it to the bottom of the pile. I saw him do it. I said, it's easy, that card's on the bottom. He said, no, that's this card. I said, fine, well, if this card's on the bottom, that card must be on the top. He said, no, that's also this card. I said, well, if this card's the bottom and the top, that card must be in the middle. He said, no, that's also this card. I said, well, that's not fair because you're using three of this card. And he said, no, that card's on the bottom. I said, yeah, but that was this card just now. He said, yeah, but so is the one on the top. Now it's also that card. I said, well, fair enough. That card's on the bottom and on the top. You're using two of that card. Uh, he said, no, I'm using three. That card's also in the middle. I said, well, if that's not fair, you're using three of that card. He said, no, I've got this card. And we've got this card. And we've got this card. I said, well, you're obviously cheating. And he said, well, yeah, you've got to remember in life, you get a little bit of this. You get a little bit of that. But you get not much of the other. Oh, I, I, I just love it. I, I, it took me two years to learn to perform that uh, myself, but that was that was an absolute inspiration. But the reason I wanted to bring that one up is a because it's a great effect. Um, but it contains various slights in it. One of the slights is called the frustration count, which you mentioned in the book, um, and I think that illustrates what you were just talking because the frustration count, the brain, there's nothing hidden. The, the slight is literally happening in front of the audience's eyes, but the bra but the brain is has none of it. Um, is that is that how the frustration count is working? Gustav? Yeah, so our brain basically, I mean, it's, it's it's hard for us to imagine just how complex vision is. Like vision is an incredibly complicated process. I mean, we're bombarded with vast amounts of ambiguous information, and so our brain must somehow make sense of all of this data. And the way that we do this is by relying on shortcuts, or we know this as heuristics as well. And these heuristics or shortcuts are great because they vastly simplify the amount of data that needs to be processed and they allow us to do this much more efficiently. But of course, like with any shortcut, it can lead to errors. And these are the kind of errors that magicians exploit. So 
a lot of magic tricks rely on exploiting some of the shortcuts that our visual system and sort of like some of our architectural cognitive processes make um, to trick our mind into seeing different things. And one of the reasons why we study these is because, of course, once you understand some of these mistakes and errors that we make, um, we can learn much more about the actual cognitive mechanisms that underpin these processes. Yeah, fantastic. And, and our job as data communicators is to do the opposite of what Gustav has spent his career trying to do. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, could, I mean, again, we kind of in the science, in the, in the magic lab, we try to do the same thing. So magicians are very good at confusing and misdirecting you. What we're interested in is, well, how can we actually use these principles and get people to see things better rather than hiding the rabbits? Yeah, absolutely. Let me show you a couple of examples uh, from the field of data visualization. So this was a chart that uh, somebody at Reuters created in 2014. It shows gun deaths in Florida. Uh, and they were trying to make a point about what happened after they changed the laws there. Uh, now, as you look at this uh, chart, everybody watching, are you seeing, where's the data? Is the data the white or the red? So have, they, have gun deaths gone up or down? Well, actually, What's going on in this is the data is here, the bar, the lines pointing down, uh, and this is white space. This is not actually white space, but uh, this this graph, this chart was widely misinterpreted because they turned the uh, data upside down. They were actually emulating another very famous chart, but in this case, because they confused the figure grand relationship, uh, they created confusion, and people thought the data was here. So perhaps it might have been better if they'd have just stuck with more standard principles so as not to create a duck rabbit style uh, visualization. Another example, uh, th this is a screenshot from an article the, the, the uh, data visualization team at The Economist did on, the, on Medium a couple of years ago or last, uh, yeah, 2019. And they were redrawing some of their own charts. So here was an original one where they had a dual axis and because of the way they scaled the Y axis, uh, they made it look like the correlation was, it looks like the correlation is extremely tight. It looks like as, uh, uh, what is this even? It's about dogs, right? Um, dogs weight and neck size as one is totally linked to the other. Now as human beings, we're not equipped to be able to easily see the different scales in the Y axis. So they then reassessed the chart a bit later and thought, well, if we actually made the Y axis a bit more honest, uh, you would see that the relationship wasn't as tight as initially displayed. And again, these are choices we make when we're charting data. You can, you always have to balance the, the, the need to show an opinion or an argument. You make the point you're trying to make, but without misleading. And I think the economist correctly thought something like this was potentially misleading, whereas this was a bit more honest because again, our eyes and our brain can't match the correlations in the Y axes. <laughs> Uh, so should we move on, uh, Gustav? Yep. Yeah, great. So the next one I wanted to talk about is color. Uh, let's go on to color. Um, this is a huge, this is a huge thing in data visualization, but talk, talk to us about color and human perception. Yeah, this is a, this is a beautiful illusion. This is by Bo Lotto as a color illusion. Um, and as I mentioned before, Perception is really about inference. And I think it's very hard for us to just appreciate how subjective our perception is. And uh, this illusion, the color, this color cube illusion, illustrates that simple properties such as color are highly suggestible and they're highly subjective. And they really the way that you perceive a color depends on how you interpret it. So, um, so we've got a color cube here. And uh, Andy, could you just point out the two key slides on the yeah so we've got one there so that color so that cube there looks um that looks brown oh. to me yeah and, the one and the bottom, that one here looks orange um definitely i, I agree it's brown and orange sure um, <laughs> it definitely you might disagree with the actual label of the color but they look very different now what's interesting is once you actually remove some of the context um you'll see that gradually they start to look more and more similar. And in reality, they are exactly the same color. Um, so they're exactly the same. And you didn't do any sneaky tricks I, in there. I promise you, I have done nothing. You didn't. And, and, um, and even and so when you add the context again, they will start to look different. Now, I 
performed, I've performed this illusion or shown this illusion thousands of times in lectures and I know exactly how it works and yet it still works. I mean, my mm -hmm. eyes, my brain is still being tricked into it. And yep. what this illustrates is, I mean, the, the reason why this illusion works is that if you perceive these two different, so the way that we perceive color is based on the context in which the color is presented. So in this context here, you are seeing the top square in the context of high illumination. So everything else is, is highly illuminated. So your brain makes an assumption, well, get under these lighting conditions, it's likely to be brown. Whilst the, the uh, square at the bottom, you're seeing that in a shaded area. And so again, your brain makes an assumption in under these lighting conditions, it's likely to be orange. And so this is an astonishing illusion, a something, a something as simple as color is a completely subjective experience. It, it, it yeah, it's brilliant. It, it, it it's just amazing because you know even building slides like this, you go, yes, I can see they're the same color, and then there's one bit where it's like, well, now they're different. What did you do to cheat? And I'm like, I did nothing to cheat. I did not cheat. Yeah. Uh, but the brain has no chance at all. And I mean, and uh, I think many of you will probably remember the sort of dress illusion, kind of which almost mm. broke the internet. And again, I mean, what this illustrates is that our perception of color is highly subjective. Some of you will see the lines as gold, others will see it as black. Now, we don't assume, we assume that our vision is reliable, uh, but it's really not. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, color in data visualization, again, to, to match, to show the opposite, or, or again, actually, this is the same pitfall, really, that magicians exploit. Um, we have this problem in data visualization. So on the left, I've got a headline from a paper where they looked at the rainbow scale uh, to understand how effective that was when people looked at a rainbow scale for temperature, for example. Do scientists actually, are they able to compare? And because now there's, ma there's many things going on, uh, with a rainbow scale beyond what Gustav has just explained. But by putting wildly different co contrasting colors next to each other um, on a map like that one on the right, you can it, it can be very hard to perceive what the actual colors are. Now, with rainbow scales, there's other, um, there's other problems in data visualization because without the legend, how would you know it? Is green higher or lower than blue? And is purple higher or lower? You, you, know, you don't know those kind of things. So again, with color perception in data visualization, we've got to be extremely careful. I, I can't, my, my advice to people is use one color. You know, some of the most effective dashboards of visualizations we ever see are just gray and in this case, blue on the left and an alert color. Don't, don't just build rainbows because you have that ability in the tool to build it. Uh, otherwise you might be creating the color cube style uh, problems. Uh, excellent. Right, uh, next one, we're going to talk about misdirection, the, the magician's absolute favorite. So, Gustav, I have a video of you performing a little trick. Should we play, let's play that first, and then you can tell us uh, what's going on. So uh, this is a very short trick. It's not really a real magic trick. It's the kind of paradigms that we use in the lab to study misdirection. Um, I guess the question to you, did you see how the light had disappeared? Uh, probably about 60% of you will have missed it. Um, so that's why Andy's showing it again. Uh, it's exactly the same clip. So what I'm doing here is I'm using misdirection to prevent you from seeing the light being dropped. Now, hopefully most of you, based on the data, probably about 95% of you will have seen that the lighter is simply being dropped into my lap. But what's happening here is I'm using lots of different misdirection cues to misdirect your attention and guide your attention away from where the lighter is being dropped. And also intuitively you think that, well, surely you should be able to see these kind of things. Basically, unless you pay attention to something, you simply won't see it. Yeah, I, it's incredible. And the the, uh, the paddle trick showed you right at the top, getting the pen back. Um, you know, many of you will not remember from your kids' child trick, child kits some of what's going on there, but there is a great piece of misdirection in that. And again, it, it's amazing learning these skills, Gustav, how, how easy it is to completely confound an audience with 
you know, just by looking over here, and then I can do something over here, and nobody notices. Um, yeah. I mean, do, have you have you done many studies on patter as well? I think one thing I discovered in learning about magic was just how I, you know, magicians talk a lot, and there's a very good reason because why they talk a lot because it stops me, the audience, processing what on earth is going on. Is that right? Yeah, so we've done lots of, I mean, I've studied misdirection for nearly 20 years now, and we've carried out lots of eye tracking studies where we look at different types of misdirection cues that magicians use to prevent you from seeing things. And the patter is a very important part. Um, so because we can't, I mean, basically, our brain has got a very limited processing capacity. Processing visual data requires vast amounts of expensive cognitive resources. And so rather than wasting resources on the irrelevant information, our brain, which is known as the kind of like the attentional system, basically selects the stuff that is of importance and ignores everything else. So, I mean, it's hard to give a kind of like a proper figure on this, but our brain processes about 5% or less of the information that is actually out there. And so by studying misdirection, we can understand why you attend to certain things. And so patter is very important. So a very common cue that magicians will use is simply asking you a question. So if I'm asking you a question, it's very hard to ignore that. Um, indeed, a lot of these social cues. So if you rewind and look at that lighter trick there, I use my eyes, the gaze to misdirect your attention. But these types of cues are very important to guide what people, uh, where people attend to. Now, again, I mean, as I'm saying, in the context of a, ma of a magic trick, we use these cues to prevent you from seeing something. But of course you can turn it all around. So if I'm looking at something, that means that everybody else will be looking at that object as well. And they'll be much more likely to actually be able to see it. Yeah, that's that's absolutely right. And um, now, so this is a this is a, this is a paper not from you, but um, I know you've done a bunch of eye tracking to study that misdirection. And again, th this plays into the field of data visualization. Um, over the last few years, myself and Amy Alberts, a colleague at Tableau, we've been uh, looking into eye tracking, doing eye tracking research on dashboards. Um, anybody who knows the famous. Jacob Nielsen uh, studies that came up with the F pattern for designing web pages. I spent about 15 years teaching people that dashboards should be designed according to an F pattern because that's how people look at the web. And Amy, who's an expert in user experience design, said to me one day, do you have any evidence that that's true, Andy Cockgrieve? At which point I was like, oh no, should we do some research? And uh, what we proved is you can create attention grabbing uh, facets on dashboards uh, that can essentially override the a tendency to an F pattern on a, a digital screen. Uh, and we'll put some links below to the white papers and webinars and other blog posts that we've done on eye tracking. Because again, when you're doing data communication, don't just throw the charts all on the screen and not think about it. Think, what is the flow? What do you want people to see first? What must people see in order to operate uh, the interactive thing you are developing? All right, last one before we get on to a bit of science, you know, how the science of magic has been developing. And the last one we're going to talk about is Gestalt principles. Uh, so I just have one slide for you to talk about on this one, Gustav. Tell us about the zigzag lady and what Gestalt is. Yeah, so Gestalt, uh, this is uh, back in the 1920s, uh, a group of German psychologists, they became very interested in trying to understand how the visual brain groups information together. Because if you think about perception, a key task is to try and work out which objects belong together. So as I'm looking out here, like I'm sitting in front of a computer, my brain receives vast amount of visual data, but somehow I need to be able to work out, well, which of this visual data actually belongs together so that I can group that together and work out, okay, I'm actually looking at the computer. And so they came up with a bunch of really clever principles. These are very low level, al we could call them algorithms now that can be used to make a guess as to which objects actually kind of, or which visual features then belong together. And these principles are often exploited in magic tricks as well. Um, so if you look at the illusion here, this is a zigzag illusion. Uh, you can put a lady or anyone really into a box um, and then you can slide the middle out of it. Now, what makes this illusion so effective is if you look at the image on the left where you've got a form, um, you've got the outline of a person printed 
on the box. That illusion is much more effective because our brain is hardwired to try and group it together. So as soon as you actually break that gestalt rule of this continuation of the person, um, that, that um, we, we realize that something is wrong. Um, whilst if you look at the object on the picture on the right, um, there the illusion isn't enforced by these gestalt principles and it's just a lot less effective. Yeah, absolutely. And this has echoes and fundamental uses in data visualization. Uh, this is a screenshot from a Tableau's and Masters blog post, Lindsay Betzendahl. And she wrote about, just, I mean, many people have written about Gestalt principles in data visualization. It's absolutely fundamental to the field. Uh, I think if you want an introduction, you can't find, there are not many better places than this. Uh, this chart shows how she's, I mean, I, I love this. She's, ta she's taken the uh, seven main Gestalt principles and given you an, a little indicator in the letters of Gestalt, how they each apply to the field of data visualization. So probably no need to go much further in depth there. But again, this is what links it all together. And uh, it's just been, oh, I, I'm, I'm really enjoying this good stuff. I hope you can tell. <laughs> so uh, they're, they're, the, they're the main principles. I mean, we, if you want to read more, go read uh, Gustav's book because it's great. But I now want to move on and talk for sort of five or six minutes about the science of magic. Because, you know, the magic lab and with your work, you've been really pioneering that. Um, and I think also with some resistance from the field of magic, I believe, right? So t tell me, you know, what, what is the science of magic? Why is it important beyond what we've already been mentioned? And maybe mention the resistance you've received to had as well. Yeah. Um, so, so, I mean, magicians have got, they've developed really clever insights into a lot of the limitations of the human brain, because of course, lots of magic relies on exploiting limitations. So we've talked about misdirection. Um, and they've got years of centuries of experience in identifying some of these perceptual errors and limitations. And uh, we can think about the progress of magic a bit like an informal scientific process. So a magician will have an idea about how the trick works and then they perform, the, they perform their effect. If it fails, then they know that their principle is wrong. And so for hundreds of years, they've been gathering all of this informal data about how the brain works. Now, I got interested in psychology because of my magic. I started off as a magician and I felt, well, if I really want to learn how to perform good magic, I need to understand how the brain works. And that's why I went to study psychology. But when I studied psychology, psychologists had no idea about magic. Nobody was studying magicians. And for me, that was quite weird because I felt, well, actually a lot of the principles that are of interest to magicians are of interest to scientists as well as an attention researcher, will surely try and use the data that magicians provide you. And so for the last 20 years, I've been trying to bridge gap, sort of bridge this gap between science and magic. And we've been developing this science of magic, which uses scientific principles to study some of the principles that magicians use. Because although some of their ideas are right, others aren't. And so what we're trying to do is use a much more scientific a more objective approach to evaluate some of these principles and not only understand which principles work, but also why they work, because that can give us great insights into how the human brain works. That's absolutely amazing. And uh, it's, it, it is, it's, it's really interesting reading about the book and re, re, reading your book and digging into the way you're applying these to other fields. Um, you know, and as we've seen, uh, the field of data visualization certainly mirrors those. And I'm sure in, other user experience, artificial intelligence, data collection. I'm sure there's many other reasons, many other yeah, ways. One of the key, yeah. I guess kind of like one of the key principles, one of the key reasons why magic works is because a lot of these, if we call them one thing sort of like these blind spots or these perceptual errors or cognitive errors, they're very surprising and counterintuitive um, because of course, if you'd be aware of all of these limitations, you would no longer be surprised by magic. Like you go, well, yeah, I'm not surprised that I didn't see the rabbit appear from the hat because I don't see anything anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and so what magic does it is allows us to explore and illuminate a lot of these really surprising limitations. And I think it provides us with a much better understanding of ourselves and others as well. Fantastic. Okay, well, that, Gustav, has uh, thrilled me completely. It's been many years I've wanted to do an episode like this, so I'm so glad you could come on 
to do it because you know so much more about the science than me. I'm an uh, amateur practitioner in the field. So that's amazing. Now t- tell people, how can people find you uh, if they want to find out a little bit more? So if you want to find more out more, um, I run the Magic Lab at Goldsmiths, University of London. So you can look at our website there. Um, also, we've got the Science of Magic Association. This is an international organization that tries to bring together magicians and scientists, uh, but also actually people from data science as well. So um, if you're interested in this, check out the Science of Magic Association website. We've got a newsletter. You can sign up for that for free um, to learn more about sort of like this really exciting new endeavor. And amazingly, I haven't signed up to that, so I'm going to do that the first thing after we finish this show. Do that, uh, and we won't spam you. You'll get kind of like a news <laughs> every few months or so, but it'll give you a bit of an insight into some of the research that's going on as well, and we hold workshops and conferences. Sounds amazing. All right, well, uh, hopefully all of you watching have uh, learned something new about one of the fields, or even better, both of the fields of magic and data visualisation. With that, Gustav, Thank you so much for making me a very happy man. I hope you have a great day. Uh, To everyone watching, let us know what you think. Uh, Tell us about your favourite magician or thing you've ever seen a magician do. Uh, And we'll see you all next time on If Data Could Talk. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Andy.